So uh, hello everyone once again. As it uh, was already mentioned, uh, my name is Andriy Syriak and today we will talk about cross-origin resource sharing. This talk consists of uh, the following chapters. The first one is called Introduction. There we will discuss the motivation behind the course and what we want to achieve using it. The second one is what if not course. And uh, there we will uh, cover other techniques that deal with uh, the same problem, but in a different way. So no course in this chapter. Uh, the third one is a bird's eye view, and it gives a high level overview of course and ways it's implemented. In the uh, fourth chapter, we'll be starting with course using ASP.NET Core, um, as the name suggests. Um, the penultimate fifth chapter uh, is dedicated to a deeper understanding of uh, course mechanics and how uh, everything works together to make things work. And uh, finally, the last one um, is called fine tuning ASP.NET Core. And uh, the, uh, there we'll take a look at most of the ways uh, an ASP.NET Core application can be set up to support course. So uh, let's get started. Um, chapter one, introduction. So uh, suppose you're building a web app, as you can see on the picture. Um, it resides at myapp.com on the left. And um, of course it has a web API that uh, resides at api.myapp.com on the right. Uh, would the setup work right away without making any changes to this? Um, well, probably not. Um, as you can see in the picture, without using course or other special techniques, this stuff wouldn't work because the browser's same origin policy limits client code from making HTTP requests to different origin. Okay, but what's the same origin policy, you might ask? So, um, the same origin policy is a critical security mechanism that restricts how a document or script loaded from one origin can interact with a resource from another origin. It helps uh, isolate uh, malicious documents, reducing uh, possible um, attack vectors. Okay, so origin, origin, but what's an origin then? So um, web contents origin is defined by the scheme or protocol, um, a host or domain, and um, a port of the URL used to access it. So by, the, by this definition, origin is a three tuples that consist of a scheme, a host, and a port. But, well, that's, that's not completely true um, because uh, there is also a so-called null origin. So it's just a null string. Uh, that uh, means that a request was made from a file on a local file system. So as you, as you know, uh, browsers can also open local files. Uh, so let's take a look at an example. Um, the following table uh, gives examples of origin comparisons with the source page. Uh, this one you can see here. So um, you can see on uh, the picture uh, parts in red are um, uh, the scheme part of origin. In blue, uh, you can see uh, domain names and in um, in black, you can see uh, the port part. So uh, if uh, the port part is not specified, we assume um, the default port. So it's 80 for HTTP. Um, so uh, you can see that uh, the first two um, rows in this table, they are considered to be the same origin to the source page because uh, they differ only in path. So dear two other and dear inner another. Uh, the third row uh, depicts a different origin because you can see uh, a different protocol here, HTTPS instead of HTTP. Uh, the fourth row is also considered to be a different origin because it uses a different port, port 81 instead of uh, the default omitted port 80. And uh, the last one uses a different uh, subdomain, so uh, that is a different host. You can see news.company.com instead of uh, star.company.com. Um, this concludes the first chapter. 
next step is uh, what if not course. Um, there is a number of different techniques that allow passing a message in some sense to a different origin, thus making a cross origin request. Not only uh, the cross origin uh, resource sharing. Let's take a look at some of them. Um, the first three on the list, uh, post message document domain and easy exam are based on um, iframes or utilize them to some degree, uh, while the last two, JSONP and reverse proxy are independent of them. So um, I'll briefly um, say what uh, each technique does. So post message technique allows pages to send uh, text-based messages to other pages by calling the post message method on a window. Uh, and the receiving window then handles the message using uh, event handlers. Since using on post, on post message requires the sender to obtain uh, the window object, messages can only be sent between a window and its iframes or pop-ups. So it's not like fully fledged cross-domain communication. Uh, the next is uh, document domain. Um, this method sets the value of uh, domain uh, of document domain to a suffix of the current do domain. So it allows to um, send cross domain requests to a shortened domain, which is also not terribly useful because um, you can't. Uh, change document domain to a completely alien domain to something uh, completely different. Um, the next one is, is XDM. It's a JavaScript library that enables to easily work around uh, the limitations set by the same origin policy. That sounds good, of course, because we all like JavaScript libraries, <laughs> I hope. Uh, but, uh, well, uh, the caveat is that uh, it has Flash as a dependency, so I, I won't even bother explaining how it works because Flash is a bit obsolete. Next is uh, JSONP and it's uh, a bit more popular than other techniques. So I have a full slide for that. Um, it allows the sender to send JSON data within a callback function that gets evaluated as JavaScript. So um, we can send, uh, we can write source um, in, a script tag to be any uh, domain, not only uh, the current domain. And so using the script, we can load, using the script tag, we can load a script from a different domain. And this technique uses that. So um, here you can see if you want to load uh, this object in green uh, from a different domain, we can call, um, we can create a script tag that uh, has uh, something like, for example, this as a source. And so a request will be made by a browser to the uh, to fetch the script. And um, the following string will be returned, my func with uh, this object in parentheses. So then the script gets evaluated by the browser. And so it's basically a call to my func. And you can handle this call in your own code and receive this object. Um, that's that's good, but the issue with JSONP is that origin, let's say, origin A, would have to trust origin B to completely because it's including arbitrary JavaScript from from origin B. So we we can't be sure that uh, this different origin origin B that we are making a request to that uh, it will return. Uh, only this and nothing else, nothing malicious. So it's not very safe technique. Next up and the last one uh, is a reverse proxy technique. So um, it uses an intermediary that sends requests to a different origin on behalf of your web application. Um, the intermediary is free to do so as long as it's not running in a browser that might enforce the same origin policy. That's pretty easy. So here you can see you can't make a request from your web app from within a web browser to a Yahoo uh, web server, but you can make a, a request to your proxy 
or to some other proxy that has course set up correctly. And then this proxy will make a request uh, to the Yahoo server on your behalf and uh, get back the response and respond to you. So this concludes uh, an overview of other techniques and now we are ready for the main dish. Um, let's get started with a proper definition. Cross-origin resource sharing is a mechanism that uses additional HTTP headers to tell browsers to give a web application running at one origin access to selected resources from a different origin. So the most important part really is that it uses additional HTTP headers. So that's really everything. Um, so let's uh, take a look at uh, the basic course flow. Uh, first, client initiates uh, an asynchronous JavaScript request. Um, the second step is uh, actually optional. So we will discuss this a bit later. It may be present or it uh, may be missing. Uh, the second step when a browser negotiates with uh, the target server details of uh, the request. And then uh, browser makes the request. And um, of course, uh, the web server responds to that request and browser checks that client can receive the response. I mean, the client JavaScript code in, in the browser. And if it can, then a uh, client receives the response. As it was mentioned, um, um, there, are, uh, there is second optional step here, as you can see. And let's take a look at a flow chart it depicts the course request flow. Um, because of the second step, that's optional, there are two paths in the flow chart, uh, paths of standard and added latencies. Um, so you can see paths of standard latency on the left in green and paths of added latency um, on the right in red. So um, in paths of standard latency, we uh, skip second step and in another path we uh, include it. Um, as it was said before, and um, as you can see from the picture, there are some additional HTTP headers um, in place, so um, let's get familiar with them. We'll get back to this flowchart uh, later, so don't worry about that. Um, so there are three request headers that uh, should be present on a cross-origin request or may be present on a cross-origin request. Uh, those are origin, which indicates origin and uh, access control request headers and access control request method headers. Uh, we'll uh, take a closer look at them later. And uh, there are also six response headers. So you can see, you can allow credentials, allow headers, methods, origin, and you can tell the browser to expose some headers and you can also use uh, the last one, access control max age, uh, for, uh, to tell proxies for how long to cache uh, the response. We'll also get back to them a bit later. Um, as to uh, the browser support, in all modern browsers course is supported, at least um, the most of it. Uh, there are some caveats that I will uh, tell you a bit later. Chapter four, starting in SP.NET Core. So that's all good, but uh, how to, to implement course support in SP.NET Core application. So for that, you really only need to call two methods here in startup. So you can see a call to add course method in configure services and a call to uh, use course in uh, the configure method. So uh, the first one adds all required uh, policies and um, other classes uh, to a, a dependency injection container. And uh, the last one um, calls them and executes them. So here you can see that a call to use course uh, goes after use routing and before use endpoints. So it's not an accident, it's actually a mandatory thing to for your application to work correctly. So uh, there is a strict ordering to middlewares in ASP.NET Core apps. And here you can see 
um, on the flow chart. Uh, course middleware should come after routing middleware and before authentication middleware. So that's basically because um, you may have different course uh, policies, so-called policies, those are sets of rules that apply depending on which uh, route you want to get access to. So routing middleware should come first because of that. Um, uh, there are also three attributes in ASP.NET Core that uh, work with course. Those are enable course, enable course with a policy name and disable course. So I'm pretty sure you already understand what they do. So they basically enable course, enable some policy name. So this the first one enables uh, the default policy and disables co course support, support altogether. This next chapter is um, the most interesting one, I would say, because it uh, tell, tells us about uh, all this uh, course machinery. So course is all about headers. So we'll start with headers. Uh, the origin header is probably uh, one of the most important headers in course, <laughs> uh, because it must be present on all course origin requests. And it, uh, its value is an origin value. So it's either a domain name or a null string, which means uh, that request was made from a local file. Uh, the next uh, header is access control allow origin. So when uh, we make a request to an API, it should tell us that, uh, okay, I allow you to get access to to me, to this API from uh, the origin that you uh, set in uh, the origin header. So to do that, um, the API sets uh, access control allow origin header uh, in its response. It also must be present on all cross origin requests and it can have uh, one of three values. So it's either a wildcard, which means allow any origin uh, or a domain name or null, null origin. Uh, so uh, here you can see that we can easily set uh, an asterisk here to allow uh, for any origin, but it's not always the best choice actually. So um, there are some other uh, ways. So for example, if you want to, uh, you can't specify two origins here, only one. So if you want to, uh, like in this example, uh, make a white list of, of um, websites that can access your API, um, you should set uh, the access control allow origin header accordingly. So if a request is made from site.example, you should set it to site.example. If a request was made from a www site.example, you should set uh, this header to the www.site.example. And if you don't want to allow some site uh, to access your API, you don't set this header at all. Um, and also, uh, there are some important uh, internet considerations. So um, let's pretend that you are building an internal API for your uh, for the software, for example. Um, and in this case, it's better not to use the wildcard or regular expressions for origin verification, because uh, an attacker might serve a web page that will try connecting to your API. So even though this web page is not on your local network, but a user is, or it may be, uh, or the user may be connected to your local network via a VPN. And when uh, he opens this evil.example web page, a request will be made from this web page to your internal web API. And it might leak uh, some uh, internal data. So it's better not to set uh, this to, to an asterisk and better to make a whitelist. So uh, let's get back to our flow chart. Um, you can see uh, here is a lot of checks like this one and this one and this one and this one. So what's uh, their purpose? Uh, well, um, they separate requests that require a pre-flight request from those that don't. This is the second optional step. So 
a prophylactic request is issued if at least one of the following is true. So uh, the request method is not simple. All the requests contains not simple headers. I will tell you about them um, in a minute. So um, here you can see on the left that uh, first we check that um, request is simple and it doesn't contain any non-simple headers. And then we make a simple request. Or oh, if um, some condition is violated, then we make options requests. So it's just a regular HTTP options request to uh, that API uh, that we make to make sure that we are allowed to call those methods. So uh, simple methods are just those three, get, head, and post. So they are considered to be simple because it's possible to send them without uh, the same origin policy being applied. So for example, as I show you, shown you uh, with uh, the JSONP te technique, we can uh, send arbitrary get methods using a script tag. Um, so next is uh, simple headers. Uh, those headers are considered to be simple. Um, because they are um, very often included and they don't make any harm to anyone if they are included. And so, uh, but the last one content type is simple only if it has value one of uh, those three in red. Well, um, there are also other conditions uh, for the headers to be simple, like um, they can't value they can have a value that's longer than 128 characters, or they can contain some uh, coarse and safe um, bytes. But you are very unlikely to encounter those limitations, so I won't uh, show them on the slide. So um, the next one is access control request method. To make a request that contains not simple method, uh, we need to uh, include this uh, header in the request to make sure that uh, the API allows to allows us to make this request. So it's it may be present on preflight request. For example, um, if you want to delete a block from a blog post. Uh, your HTTP verb would uh, be delete according to uh, REST, but it's not a simple HTTP verb. So you should send a preflight request first. And in this preflight request, there should be an access control request method header set with a value of delete. And uh, the server should respond to this request with a header of access control allow methods. So he allows us to use those methods. And um, it can be either an asterisk, which means allow any method, or a comma separated list of uh, HTTP verbs. So uh, you can see that inclusion of simple methods is optional, um, but it's optional if um, other uh, limitations are, aren't violated, like. Um, like lengths of headers and so on. So, and uh, if you uh, use an asterisk, it can be only used when there are no cookies and authentication info in this request. So, um, and even more than that, not all browsers, not all modern browsers support uh, the asterisk value. So I would um, suggest to just use a list of verbs that are supported. Um, Next one is um, access control request headers. So what if your request contains some headers? So very often you want to include some uh, additional information alongside your request. And um, of course, it's not a simple header. So um, you should uh, send a preflight request first. You send this options preflight request with access control request headers uh, header set. And um, its value is a set uh, is a list of um, headers that you would like to send to the server. 
so you don't set a value of this header uh, yourself. You just set uh, the headers you want to send and then browser sets uh, this header for you. It's uh, rather convenient. And uh, to make things work, the server should respond that uh, it allows to use those headers with access control allow headers, header. Um, it, it's very similar to the access control allow methods header. It can also have an asterisk value, which is only possible when there are no cookies and authentication information like authentication or authorization headers, for example. And it's a comma separated list of allowed headers. And um, an interesting uh, thing is that uh, authorization header can be wild carded like that. So if you want to include authorization header, you should put it uh, here in the list. Um, so as it was discussed here, you can use uh, wildcards if there are no uh, cookies and uh, authentication information. So what if we want to include uh, cookies? Then uh, we need to um, uh, set in response from the server. So it's decided by the server whether or not we are allowed to send cookies to it. Uh, we should set uh, the access control allow credentials header to a true value. So it's the only possible value for this header. And if it's true, then we are free to send cookies. If it's missing or has some other value, the browser won't send cookies uh, alongside the request. Next up is, um, and it's um, pretty last one, um, access control expose headers. So uh, here, let's get uh, a little back. You can see that we can allow to send us headers, but if we set some headers in a response, so for example, we set uh, some custom headers in the response and our client application wants to uh, read values of those headers. Uh, then uh, the request would succeed, but our client application would find that there are no those headers at all. It can't read them. Uh, why? But they were sent with the request. That's because they were blocked by a uh, browser and to tell uh, the browser to sh show, to expose uh, those headers to the client code, we need to set uh, the access control expose headers value. Uh, it's the same um, thing as uh, access control allow headers, a list of headers that we would like our uh, client code to see. Um, it, it may be a really a tricky one because if you don't know that you should allow uh, the browser to, uh, that you should allow your code in the browser to see those headers, it may be a tricky one to find really because you send those headers, but you don't receive them. <laughs> and uh, the last one is access control max age. It's completely optional, so nothing really uh, depends on it, uh, other than um, it tells the browser for how long to cache uh, a response to a pre-flight request. And that's related to the fact that you can't, uh, you can't set um, caching options uh, for options requests. So it's uh, the only way to tell a proxies, for example, or, or browser for how long you would like to consider this response to be accurate. But there are different limitations in browsers, like uh, Chrome sets it for, um, for a day, I believe, max. So you can set it to be more than a day, and Firefox sets it for five minutes. Um, it's more like a performance optimization uh, kind of thing. So the next chap the last chapter is fine tuning ASP.NET Core. And I would like to show you uh, a little demo here because um, <clears throat> uh, after the demo, you will be able to set up your uh, application for course in, in any possible way you would like. <laughs> so um, here you can see those uh, three um, headers you can apply enable a course header or disable course header or attribute, excuse me, attribute <laughs> uh, to uh, controllers, to uh, pages, to uh, methods and so on. So uh, for example, 
here you can see that uh, general policy is a policy course policy is applied to to all um, methods in this uh, controller for example to the put one method here you can see that um, we apply a default policy to put two methods so it overrides uh, the one was before if we don't specify policy name it always applies uh, the default policy uh, here you can see that we can also apply a named policy to a, um, to a method and we can also disable call course altogether and that's really all uh, there is to it uh, to attributes. And let's get back to uh, the startup class. Here you can see that um, in order to use course, we first need to set them up to set up policies. And uh, here you can set up a policy by hand, or can you, uh, or you can use a policy builder, which I will show you a bit later. So support credentials uh, field corresponds to uh, access control allow credentials, which means, yeah, okay, send me cookies uh, and um, authentication information, it's fine, I'll handle it. A list of origins is a list of, is a white list of allowed origins. Or if you don't want to uh, use a white list or you have a varying amount of origins or you would like to use a regular expressions, for example, you can supply a predicate uh, that uh, decides whether or not an origin is allowed. It, um, accepts uh, origin value and returns um, boolean. Um, this is a white list of allowed headers and a, a list of exposed headers. And uh, in methods, you can see a list of allowed methods. So this is uh, what will be set in access control allow methods uh, header. And the last setting here is preflight max h which uh, tells the browser for how long to cache uh, the response. So this is a value for access control max h um, header. So basically uh, you can uh, add policy like that if you build it by hand or you uh, build it using a builder, which offers uh, a lot of convenience methods. Or you can add named policies uh, with a policy object or with a builder. So builder, allow credentials, disallow credentials, allows or disallows using of cookies and auth information. Allow any header, method, and origin is basically uh, sets uh, wildcard values to those uh, headers, to the corresponding headers. Or you can set a white list like that. So it's pretty simple. Also here, uh, an important note, uh, you can see uh, an asterisk. So <clears throat> uh, you can uh, set, you can call a method, set is origin allowed to allow wildcard subdomains. And using an asterisk, you can allow uh, any subdomain of test.com domain to access uh, your uh, web API. If you don't set, if you don't call this method, set is origin allowed, then this asterisk will be interpreted um, as an asterisk and will just match an asterisk and that's it. Um, here you can add exposed headers and uh, the same for uh, um, a predicate that decides whether or not to allow an origin and the same for uh, the caching options. You can get a policy if you would like to. So if you have a, a tiered uh, setup or something like that, you can set up a bit of policy first and then uh, complete the setup in a different place. And um, here you can uh, use the same thing. So you can either use uh, attributes to, um, to set up course policies or you can uh, specify policy here. And then this policy will be applied for every request. Uh, the same thing here with builder. You can build your policy here. Um, and uh, the last thing is that you can um, apply different um, policies without attributes. Uh, if you want, uh, there are extension methods require course. Here in uh, after map, we can call them. And it's, it's all pretty simple. So you just set up 
uh, a policy and then it gets evaluated and responds with uh, the corresponding um, headers and that's it. So let's, that's basically the end of my talk. Let's get a quick recap to refresh what we have learned today. I hope you found this information useful. So um, in the first chapter, we uh, discussed the motivation behind, behind the course and what we want to achieve using it. So it's basically to circumvent the same origin policies uh, limitations, if way not like JSONP because it opens a security hole in your application. Uh, course, using courses is fairly uh, secure if you use it right way, of course. So um, in the second chapter, uh, other techniques that deal with um, the same problem in a different way were discussed, like JSONP and reverse proxy. Um, in the third chapter, we got familiar with course and ways it's implemented. So there are two paths in uh, the course flow, path of standard latency and path of added latency where we send a pre-flight request first to make sure that uh, the destination server doesn't get uh, a request that uh, it doesn't want to get. Really, because um, before course, you couldn't uh, just send uh, arbitrary requests because of the same origin policy. So course should be uh, very um, conservative in that. Um, in the fifth, um, um, excuse me, in the fourth chapter, we uh, learned how to make um, any ASP.NET Core application course aware. So there are those methods that add course and that use course. And there are also two attributes, enable course and disable course that apply policies. Um, in the fifth chapter, we gained a deeper understanding of course mechanics and how they all work together to make things operate smoothly. Um, there was a handful of access control request headers. So you can request um, a method, you can request uh, a header, and there was a handful of access control allow headers. So uh, the destination server can allow you to use, uh, to get access from this origin. The destination server can allow you to use this method to include these headers. Uh, the destination server can allow you to use credentials. Um, yeah, and uh, in the last chapter, we fine-tuned uh, course in an ASP.NET Core app to fit any need, really. So um, you can set up policies uh, using a builder um, or you can set up policies by hand and you can apply them using, uh, act, uh, using attributes or uh, using um, methods in the startup class. So uh, this concludes my talk. Uh, here uh, at the end, you can find the list of references. I will share uh, this presentation with you in some way. I don't know how yet. So you can go through them and uh, do your own research if you would like to. And uh, I would be pleased to answer uh, your questions if you have uh, some. <laughs>